Frank. Pleasure to meet you, Bob. Pleasure to meet you. I'm not touching your last name. <laughs> okay, Vignola. That's Vignola right. depends where you are in the that, world. That's right, that's right. And you told me a funny story before the show that Les Paul could Always never pronounce my name. Can never pronounce my name. Can never Frank, pronounce it. Frank yeah. Vignola, he used to say. <laughs> And Lou Paulo, who was with Les for all those years, right. he always used to say, it's Vignola, Vignola, <laughs> well, it's Italian. Yeah, that's, that's right, so and funny. Les wasn't, so. Vignola. <laughs> uh, let's back up to your childhood. Oh, we don't so, want to do that. Uh, it's only, it was what, a 20 child. years ago? Was no, it? no, uh, 40, <laughs> 43 years ago, at the age of six, I oh. started playing the guitar. You did? Inspired okay. by a Django Reinhardt record. Mm. A Joe Pass record and a Les Paul record. Okay. Right. Any anyone right. in your family music? My that? father plays the tenor banjo, okay. and he used to have a little band, semi-professional. They used to work on weekends, so they used to have jam sessions over the house. Okay. And he taught me the chords to all those songs, and you know, uh, by the time I was ten and eleven, I bet I knew two hundred songs. Yeah. Just from because those banjo bands, they used to play medleys. Of, Right. You know, 10 minute medleys of 10 songs in a medley and just go, you know? Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. Do so you find yourself doing those songs t today, ever being called on? The one we started with was Carolina in the Morning. Oh, right. 1911. Okay. And, you know, they're such great melodies and uh, they lend themselves well to kind of a Latin rock acoustic guitar uh -huh. rhythm, yeah, yeah. which Vinny does so beautifully. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Now, is your father alive today? He is alive. He okay. has a nice tenor banjo collection down in North Carolina and uh, still plays. And, uh, you know, see him down there when we tour and he comes up. We're going to Italy together. <laughs> Vignola. Because <laughs> right. we're playing a festival over there. Oh, so okay. him and my, uh, my and his cousin are going to come with all me. Right. Do so. they play with you at all? Or does he ever play with you, your father? Well, we jam, okay. obviously. Uh, you know, we'll have them up on a show if we're in the area, <laughs> especially beautiful. local, and people that's, love that stuff. Yeah, right? that's beautiful. So you went from there to... Uh, uh, to music school when I was 13. Okay. Uh, I went to a cultural arts high school in Long Island okay. from the ages of 13 to 16. And then I graduated high school uh, a half year early. Number one, during high school, I was working probably five nights a week playing rhythm guitar and tenor banjo in traditional jazz bands. Mm. So uh, by the time I graduated high school, I actually doubled up on classes to graduate a half year early so I can go on tour with Max Morath because there was an offer to go on tour with him starting like January 10th in 1985 or So you were like actually. 17 at the time. Yeah, 1984. I was, no, I think I was, it was right out of high school. I was 18. I had just turned 18 okay. on December 30th. Okay. So, and that's what I did. I doubled up on classes and graduated honors, you know, because of all the music school grades. It was an honors uh, school. So, uh, and, and instead of going to college, I just went on the road, got a little pad in Manhattan, and started networking, knocking on doors, taking lessons from guys like Howard Alden and oh. other kind of the masters. Okay. You know. And uh, through that, I, I just accumulated a lot of. Uh, contacts for work. Yeah, yeah. And that was the key, and that's kind of what they don't teach you in music school, is like how to get Networking. out there and get work. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just stumbled upon it because there's no way I'd wanted to spend time in a classroom <laughs> anymore. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. having too much fun playing. But you, know? you were considered pretty great at the time, though, I'm sure, back uh, being a teenager. Um, Above your peers, would you say? I mean, I think the reason why people would say that is just because I work so many gigs. Mm. You know, I got so much on-the-job training with professionals like Les Paul, yeah. like uh, uh, Max Morath, mm -hmm. like Howard Alden, like, right. you know, Bucky Pizzarelli. I mean, yeah. how can you learn more than yeah, sitting on yeah. a bandstand playing in front of a full crowd? Right. Right. For uh, you know, with a guy like that, yeah. with someone yeah. like. But at people. the same time, you have to be at that level to be with them as well. I so. mean, I guess so. I, I there's still so much to learn, uh, obviously. But I was real serious about it. You know, I never had to be told to practice. I mean, I'd be told to, hey, can you turn the amp down? <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I was practicing you so much, it. and yeah. I was always active doing music. Yeah. So I think people who are considered great 
it's just a passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a love for it. it right, it's right. a love for it. You don't think about anything else mm -hmm. except, you know, hey, I got a gig tonight. I yeah. remember waking up and uh, saying, you know, uh, I got a gig today. Great, jump out of bed, you know. <laughs> Did you ever have to deliver pizzas or anything outside? No, of my home? mother did make me get a summer job. Okay. One summer. One summer. One summer, which was a uh, 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 like a camp director for the town. So, you know, all the kids would come and we'd play kickball and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The ironic part is I missed at least two days a week because of gigs. <laughs> <laughs> Which paid more probably. Which paid more than, than the whole. It's right. just so funny. Right, you know? right, right, right. But I'm glad she did it because it made me realize like, wow, look at the opportunity I have here to do something yeah. I really enjoy instead of saying, I got to get up for work today. What yeah. are you kidding me? Sure, sure, sure. So you went on from there. And uh, yeah, I know you played and did CDs with Howard Alden. That was a little later on. Okay, but what's that like studying off of somebody and then being? Well, Howard I met actually through the tenor banjo when I was 13, and I think he was 15, maybe 16. And uh, we met at a banjo convention in California. Mm -hmm. And I remember I just rounded the corner and I heard like this jazz banjo which I never heard a tenor banjo played like Joe Pass. And I see this, you know, kid my own age. I'm like, what are you kidding me? You know, so I, I grabbed his guitar and I started backing him up and he was like surprised himself. And then we were just friends ever since. When That's he great. moved to New York, you know, he was working with Joe Bushkin and Benny Goodman. I mean, he was yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Red Norvo. Right. So I was like, I want to take some lessons with you, mm -hmm. you know, and we'd spend hours together in his apartment. More and, playing uh, problem. Well, right. yeah, playing, but yeah, a lot of studying, though. Yeah. You know, turning yeah. me on to Bach and mm -hmm. George Van Epps. And, oh, that's you know, beautiful. These, I mean, he had, his apartment was lined with transcription books. Mm -hmm. Every record that he had, he had transcribed the solos. He did? He did. Oh I'm not gosh. kidding you, Bob. It's no, I walls it. full of transcription books. That's amazing. It's one thing to learn them. It's another thing to write it in out. In hand. In right? hand. I mean, back then there wasn't yeah. a finale, right, but right. I mean, and so neat, you know? Yeah, yeah so he's... Uh, yeah, he's, passion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great player, great yeah, player, yeah. Good guy. Yeah, too, so. I remember seeing you probably has to be at least 17, 18 years ago Where was it, at man? a guitar show. You were in with Island? another endorser, right? You Bob were endorsed, right? Yeah, playing Probably in the late 90s. Yes. Yes. And uh, I'll never forget, you're on stage and you're playing just picture perfect. And you yelled out, sloppy. I thought, what is sloppy about that? Really? You I don't picked, remember, yeah, really? yeah, you picked it up, but uh, yeah. maybe someone else yelled at it. No, <laughs> I don't think so. It was you. It was you. I thought, uh, where? You know, it's like picture perfect. Oh, that's uh, yeah, funny. yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember Tommy Emmanuel saying to me on the show here about yeah. you yeah. because you two have performed together, and he said the difference between you and him is that you can sit down and stop and say what you're playing where he cannot do that, so. Yeah. yeah, which really begs the question, like all of the real true greats, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but Django couldn't even write his name. He had no yeah. idea what he was yeah. doing. Les Paul, when him and Bing Crosby did uh, one of the, it's been a long, long time, None of, neither of them read music. Mm -hmm. So they were handed the music and they're like, we don't read. <laughs> and a piano player who was the lighting guy played it for them, they learned it, yeah. and it became a hit song. Mm -hmm. When you're learning a song, yeah. do you find yourself reading the music or just doing it by ear? The way I learn a song is to, first of all, go on YouTube now and get every version I could possibly find. Pick the ones I like and then learn it by ear. Okay. Then I will go back to the music if I can get the original music mm -hmm. and just learn the correct melody, the way the composer wrote it. It's hard to find original music these days. I mean, a lot of the books that they have out there, fake books, are kind of oh, yeah. it's interpretation that's true. of the song. That's true. So, but I think by going to the classic versions, especially Sinatra versions, mm -hmm. Nat King Cole with the great string writing, Ella Fitzgerald, you get not only the original chords, but then some unbelievable substitutions. Right. But you steal. also find out how simplistic they are compared to 
the so, real books today. Yeah. It's, it's you know obvious. The song, that. Uh, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Mm -hmm. I had to yeah. do a little arrangement of that for a company over Christmas. So I'm like, you know, it's always been kind of confusing, that song, to me, because there's a lot of chord changes. I went to the Sinatra version with Gordon Jenkins, I believe, arrangement. And like you said, the chords were so simple. Mm -hmm. Just the one chord, Sparse. then a five chord, then another one chord. No substitutions. And I'm like, oh, the melody makes so much sense now. Right, right. Instead and of that, guys putting in all kinds of substitutions. That would probably attract more people to study music had they had the original, rather than look at these complicated pieces Correct. today. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, gets, it gets a little out of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, some of your other influences, any rock influences? Um, when I was about 15, I think, I uh, kind of decided, OK, let me see what this guy Frank Zappa is all about. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was an A track when I was looking through the the bins and you know it was the on sale bin studio 10 and yeah. Frank Zappa with that <laughs> right. Faye in the cool cover I'm like let yeah. me check this out so I remember I put it in the car and uh, let me take you to the beach came out uh, of the system and I had the you know the subwoofers the whole you know I was really into the sound then yeah. and it changed my life it did absolutely it did. not only his writing but his guitar that was my introduction to rock and roll yeah. so okay. everything to me after that was a little just under as far as yeah, quality. Yeah, level, level. You know, right, right. I love Led Zeppelin. I love the Stones. I right. mean, well, the Beatles, I think yeah. they were kind of the last of the great songwriting teams. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their music will be around in 400 years. Mm -hmm. And we happen today to be at the Peter Max Art Studio, yeah, which is a Beatles artist. And I see Paul McCartney over there and, and about and nine it, paintings of Frank Sinatra. Yeah, so what right. inspiration. That's right. So speaking of Frank Zappa, has anybody like Dweezil ever come up to you in public? Or? No, we've played at a few of the same festivals, but I never had the chance to, to meet him. Okay. I did record Let Me Take You to the Beach. Uh, never released it because, um, you know, it's uh, uh, just to get the licensing yeah. of Zappa songs is very difficult. Yeah, I bet so it is. So I just don't have the patience to right. go through that process yet, you know. Right. I read on your bio you worked also with Ringo Starr. Is I did on a Leon Redbone record. Oh, great. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That was pretty interesting. Yeah. Leon Redbone and Ringo Starr <laughs> in the same room. Oh. I was I was young then too. I mean, I'm still young, but I was in my 20s then. Was it jazz? Uh, it was a uh, it was like a Hawaiian uh, I forget the name of the song, a Hawaiian style you song. always end up with these banjo <laughs> type or yeah, ukulele. Yeah, well, it was guitar, uh, yeah. like old style. Right. You know, I think I actually played Leon's old Gibson L4 mm -hmm. for that yeah. sound, you know. Yeah. And then I did another thing with Redbone with Joe Venuti. Oh, yeah. The violinist. Sure. But it was after Joe died. Oh. So it was a track they had. Oh, my gosh. Leon wasn't happy with his rhythm guitar part. So I just had to listen to Joe Venuti and play along. Okay. Which was, you know, the next best thing yeah, to play with Joe Venuti. It's usually George Barnes and Joe oh, Venuti, well, I think well, of. Oh, well, George and, Barnes uh, was the yeah, best. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he yeah. was. I, I hear a lot of George, well, I hear a lot of the greats in your playing as well. I don't like to put people in boxes, but if I had to, you're... A, could be classified as a gypsy jazz guitar player? Not be quite, because I think the term gypsy jazz has come up only in the last uh, maybe 15 years at most. Um, again, you know, people having to label music. And that's really specifically Django Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. You know, there's gypsy jazz groups all over America, and they really, you know, I mean, they get the same guitars, they do the same solos, they have the same configurations, the same rhythm styles, um, and really, uh, 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 what, what's the word? It's kind of like a repertory mm -hmm. style. Right. You know, I love Django, I own so every like one of his records, but I also love Charlie Parker, I own mm -hmm. every one of his records. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the list goes on. I mean, my, rec my jazz record collection was over a thousand at one point. Mm. And that's, you know, wow. I would buy records and I would play along with them, learn the songs, and that's what I would do in, yeah, in the day. And, you know. Kenny Burrell said, listen to as much jazz as you practice it. 
Absolutely. And what better than playing along with records? And I would kind of make believe I was in the band and I would hang like some of these, you know, jazz records, there were nine minute songs. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I need to get the endurance and know how to play with, you know, great jazz guys because I had gigs with classic jazz guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would just play along with the records and comp and make sure I was listening to the sax, make sure I was connecting with the bass and, you know, kind of like real practice right. as if I was in the... Well, in you, the weren't, you weren't trying to be a star. You were just helping along, uh, backing That's the up. the guitar's role, you know, as an accompaniment instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's a lead instrument too, and it's a solo instrument, but mainly it's an accompaniment instrument. If you want to work a lot, you really should know a lot of songs mm -hmm. and learn how to play a lot of different styles. And, and you there's work, a ton of work out there. You work a lot. I have worked a lot, and I continue to work a lot. Mm -hmm. yes. How many nights a year? Uh, let's see. Last year was probably about 180. Uh, the year before that was, I think, over 200. I wow. mean, these are nights away. Mm -hmm. uh, the year before that, I, you know, Vinny and I alone have done 1,000 gigs in the last six years. Mm. Wow, wow. And you, you know, travel to Europe and all, over, uh, all the world. over the world. Yeah, we're supposed to go to Russia this fall, but the uh, concert was canceled because of the situation over there. Where do you think jazz is most appreciated? I think all over the world, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in America, we go all over the place, and we get a lot of people who, you know, I mean, they might not necessarily be hardcore jazz fans, mm -hmm. but they're music fans. And they're guitar fans, and I think, you know, there's one reason why uh, guys like me and Vinny can go out and get so much work, and I think that's due to Tommy Emanuel. Mm -hmm. Not only the classics, but Tommy has forged the path and brought so many different style guitar players into one room to hear him play <laughs> that it's created a whole, you know, network of, of people that will now be exposed to what I do, people who like jazz will be exposed to what Tommy does. People who like bluegrass, you know, Tony Rice, they right. like what we do. Now he kind of brought them all together. It's yeah. really amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's it beautiful. is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. How long is it recording with Tommy? It's just fun to be around him from waking up in the morning and going down to the lobby and seeing him there jamming a song <laughs> as the road manager's checking out and we're jamming and practicing what we're going to play. That's great. Good night, you know. That's great. Yeah. He's just a very positive, uh, inspiring person. Yeah, nice person. Like all the great guitar players I know. I'm Les Paul, George Benson, they're all just really nice, I found that the people. bigger the people are, the nicer and more down to earth. That's amazing. Isn't yeah. It? So those guys in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some names? No, no I'm, I'm kidding. kidding. So, so which guitar yeah. are we playing? This is a Ryan Thorell. Um, when Benedetto stopped their endorser models mm -hmm. about eight years ago. Which you were one. I was one, mm -hmm. yes. And um, people started sending me guitars, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe it, sure. Why not? So I checked out a bunch of them. Some I bought, some I sent back. And when I got this one, I was just like, wow, yeah. how cool. It's unusual with the pickup configuration, how it just There is goes. a reason for this. And actually, ironically, the guitar that Les used to play yeah. had angled pickups. It, it did. I remember. I don't the know the old, reasoning. He, Ryan explained I, it to me once and I, I <laughs> did, had, you know. I think he had like the original Les Paul, right? Zero, zero, one. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. You hear like yeah, zero, yeah, zero, yeah, one yeah, on the yeah. back of the pickup. Yeah, so that was have, like the yeah. one they sent him yeah. in 1952. <laughs> and he had one of those old straps on too from like he 1950. He used to leave that thing on a stool that went like, you know those round bar stools yeah. that twist? Yeah. He used to just leave it on there. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was all shredded. Different pickups, <laughs> knobs. I mean, but that's what yeah, made him that's, yeah, that's, it, the it genius was that he that's was. Right. Not only electronically, <coughs> but I don't think people realize that if he wasn't as great of a guitar player as he was, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think he, you know, any, nobody else at the time could do what he did with the technology. Yeah. Because other people were working on stuff, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. But he had the ability to play and, and just yeah. do this amazing yeah. stuff and then harmonize well, it. And then it's like, what is this? People thought he would take his tracks and double them, speed them up. But it was really him playing in real time. 
Well, yeah. So he had the chops to back it up. So, right, yeah. and the production skill and mind to mm -hmm. go into a song knowing what he wanted to kind of come out with. You worked with Les for many years. Five as, years, yes. And, and I've been friends with him since I was 19. And he, of course, he's the late Les Paul. Right. But how did that come about? You, um, I met him because uh, I heard he was looking for a rhythm guitar player hmm. when he first emerged from retirement in the, uh, in the 80s and started playing at Fat Tuesdays downtown. And um, I went down to meet him, the guy who was uh, broadcasting the shows on radio, Rich Conady, uh, from the big broadcast, great DJ, old music. Um, he called me and said, come down and meet Les. I said, okay. So I went down and we had dinner together. And he was very inviting, had me sit in. And they used to sit on stools and he had me sit in back on the chair. Okay. So I was in back with this <laughs> D'Angelico New Yorker, 1957. Right. Right, right. And he heard that I could strum a little rhythm. And then he gets up off his stool and he uh, invites me to sit on a stool. And then he invited another guitar player up and he said, okay, you guys have a jam. And he walked off the stage, <laughs> right? So we had a jam, brought the house down. Oh, yeah. And I remember that night about 3.30 in the morning, the phone rings, you know, like 3.30 in the morning. And I was always up late to pick it up. It was less because he used to stay up all night. Yeah. So ever since then, you know, we were, we were right. friends. Well, something you don't know, Lou Palo told me over the phone. He said, you know, when Frank first came on board, Les said, I better start practicing. And you inspired him to practice. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because hey, he wasn't going to come back. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. There, there were nights, I understand, that he could not come out on stage. So you were... Just once. This, oh, really? Okay. Just once. Okay. But because you were the, insu sick. He was you were the insurance up. for that, though. Well, I mean, it's not easy to play a show when, you know, 200 people come mm -hmm. expecting to hear the great Les Paul. Right, right. And they're like, oh, by the way, folks, Les is sick, <laughs> and here's Frank Vignola. And they're like, Vignola, Vignola, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, thank God that only happened once. Yeah, yeah. You know? And the other times, Lou called me to sub for less when he was sick for six weeks. Oh, okay. And then one night, the phone rings, and it's less, and he sounded pretty frail, and he's like, I think I'm going to come back and play. I'd like you to, you know, I'd like you to join me, but I'm just going to sit back and, and watch and you know, maybe I'll play a song. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you know, kind of felt bad. Like, yeah. really, you're not going to play? Mm. You know, that's what I said. I said, we could do a little something. I said, you know. So then I showed up, and there he was at Soundcheck and practicing away. And, okay, we're going to do Brazil. And it was like the guy just <laughs> all of a sudden was back, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, so, you inspired him. That's good. I'm yeah, glad. Yeah. He inspired and Brazil. Oh, wow. Brazil. So, I, mean, I mean, come on. That's his. We still play his arrangement. Uh, oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because it's so hip. It's timeless. Yeah, it know? is. And how, how high the moon. Oh. And he had that beautiful, embraceable you, that little tag on the end. Yo, right, That was his signature. <laughs> that's what, yeah. Yeah, that was it. So, yeah, yeah. So, um,. What? That's uh, great. You know that stuff. Oh yeah, by the way. yeah, yeah. For a guitar well, geek uh, like me, yeah, that's yeah. like. Yeah. Uh, I love it. I love it. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody getting into the guitar today? Um, learn how to get gigs. Okay. And learn as many songs as you can. It's not about. I mean, you got to learn the theory, obviously. Um, also, apply the theory to songs. That's the other thing. A lot of people learn theory, and they learn a few songs, but they never say, "Hey, let me put the theory into this chord progression." Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and just learn melodies. If you know a hundred songs, you, you're, you're golden. Yeah, and you can repeat. I know guys who know nothing about music, and I'd rather play with them than guys who know all about music but can't really play songs. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then learn how to get work, you know. That's, it's, there's so much work out there now, mm. especially for a couple of guitar players. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much work out there, and it's very easy to promote yourself mm -hmm. with the advent of the Internet. Yeah. Made it possible for guys like me and even a guy like Tommy to reach millions of people. Of the world. 
The entire world. The yeah. entire yeah. world. I mean, <laughs> Tommy would tell me when he would go to a country for the first time, there would be a thousand people there waiting to hear him play because mm. of YouTube. Mm. So it's it's pretty cool, you know. It took away having to be with a record label. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. You know, it hurt the labels, but at the same time, it helped the artists. This is America, isn't it? Yeah, it's competition. You know, right, people right. say, oh, the, the streaming. We have to learn how to work with this technology. Yeah, That's what do. this country's all and about. And it will and only grow Yeah, from here. how do I take the technology and use it to my advantage? Yeah, yeah. Because it could be used to everybody's advantage. Yeah, and so to it's me, an it's, attitude, you know. to me, it's a little overwhelming at times, but still. It's overwhelming, but, you know. It's a necessary evil. It's or, what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, records went out, right? Cassettes went out, CDs, CDs. are now going out, True. and soon MP3s are going to be done because everybody's going to stream to listen yeah. to what they yeah. want. To. You have a number of instructional books. In fact, I I love writing instructional. Books. I love your arpeggio book. I went I, through that from cover to cover. Really learned a lot. Oh I yeah, have eighteen yeah. Mel Bay books, mm -hmm. and I have eight. Uh, courses on truefire.com. Hey, Brad's a great guy. I love Brad. Unbelievable. Yeah. I have thousands. He's I don't know. Honest, he's an unbelievable perfect producer. Perfect guy. Yeah. But he pays you, too. It's, <laughs> our, is, it's your, your own is, part of what you, you know, you yeah, own it. Yeah. And yeah. he pays you a royalty that right. is far beyond anything you can right, find out right. there. So, and he wants you to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. And there's something to that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. all my stuff I do for Truefire. Now. Yeah, he's a beautiful guy. You know, and he's a great producer. I remember I went down there with two projects in particular. One was called Inversion Excursion. Okay. And he just wanted like, you know, an eight uh, video thing on... On in inversions. court inversions. Right. right. So we sat down at the pre-production meeting and I laid out like, well, it's going to be hard to show these unless we show these. And then it's going to be hard to show these. <laughs> and before so you know it, your 20 hours a day later. and a half, right. we had a 1,400-page inversion book going over every possible way you can get an inversion on the guitar. Okay. I'll buy that. <laughs> Just amazing, you know, yeah. with play-along tracks. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And then there was another one called A Modern Method for Guitar, which started off as a student of mine who wrote down all the lessons we did in about a five-year period. And it look like a book so I said let's get a you know a little get some video to it by the time it was done it was like here is the fingerboard <laughs> you know from step one <laughs> to completion to completion yeah, yeah. basically I mean there's always stuff that can be added you mm -hmm. know but he, he's he's great I love him. you also have one vamps I think it vamps, is that was the first one okay Okay. Where we would just take a simple one chord vamp and I would go over basically everything you can do on a D minor chord, mm -hmm. including using none of the notes in D minor scale and playing completely outside and out of tempo. That's cool. So, yeah. That's cool. Know, so. And now, go through the list of all the guitar players, if you can, that you've worked with, the legends. I know there's been so many. Um, well, let's see. Bless Paul. I mean... I mean, through Les, I almost feel like I've met Django, mm -hmm. as crazy as that, as that sounds, including no, playing crazy. Django's guitar, which his wife gave to Les. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Bucky Pizzarelli, Al Kyola, mm -hmm. we've been working with Legend. recently, 94, I mean, possibly the greatest studio guitar player of all time, mm -hmm. besides Tony Mottola. Um, Tommy Emmanuel. Uh, Legends, I mean, Al Viola, uh, Marty Gross, uh, Joe Pass, Herb Ellis. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I studied with Joe when oh. he would come to New York. I would go up to the Waldorf Astoria, okay. bring him blueberry what muffins. What was that like? Uh, the first lesson consisted of about two and a half hours of uh, eating muffins. <laughs> And smoking Cuban cigars. I love it. Like his cup. Just talking. Like the album cup. Telling me about Oscar Peterson <laughs> and how they used to get off stage arguing because they couldn't stand each other's oh, comping. <laughs> you know? I mean, here they that. are, a thousand people going it. nuts and calling for more, and they're yelling at each other <laughs> off stage. Why don't you call that comping? Yeah, you call that comping. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the greats. I mean, just... just Joe Pass and yeah, Oscar Joe Peterson. Yeah, Joe Pass. I mean, come on. <laughs> so he then, uh, after that, he said, hey, you like to change strings? So I changed the strings. <laughs> and then he picked like up his guitar. And he and said, Washington. what do you want to play? 
And I said, uh, right, it's, right, <laughs> exactly. So uh, I said, how about... Uh, uh, da I can't remember the names of the songs now. Da -da 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 -da. Taking a chance on love. Thank okay. you, Vinny. So he said, okay, what key? I said, C, and we proceeded to play, and he had his, you know, he used to play with his fingers and keep his pick in his mouth, and then he says, now watch this, and he takes his pick out and starts going. So that was the lesson, <laughs> right? Then the next one, after the same thing happened, you know, which yeah. I looked for, it was but great. you learn. I mean, I, mean, I was so into, I mean, hanging out with Joe Pass just as a guy mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, yeah. you know, and then the next one consisted of keeping one note on top and playing the scale, right? Then go dominant, so then basic. minor. Then you move up to B flat, keeping the A on top, and now you play a, then minor. And then move up to B. Right, I was I like, I never uh, knew that. I spent years with that. This and is that my first it. introduction to it. I know. That's great. That's, Thank that you. That was his lesson. I That's enough. Share. Absolutely. That's enough. Uh, and then you... I met him again at the Blue Note. <laughs> and he was coming off stage with his manager, who I knew. I said, Hi, you know, it's Frank. This is my girlfriend, Kate. And he just kind of looked. He's like, Come on, let's go. <laughs> he just looked <laughs> up the door with his manager. <laughs> He was probably <laughs> wanted to go to bed. You know? Yeah, right, right, right. So Don't bother funny. me, kid. Right, you know? right. Well, yeah. yeah. You worked with one of my favorite guitar players, is Gene Bertensini. Gene Bertensini. As a person uh, as well. Just well, a beautiful Well, he person. changed nylon string guitar. He did. And I think the way he puts his arrangements together, there's no one else yeah. in the world. Yeah. And he's improvising guitar. a lot of that, too. And his uh, improvising just, is just, I mean, talk about easy to play with. Mm. Gene is the man. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice person. Yep. Any rock people you worked with, blues? Mm. Um, um, well, a lot of guys sat in with Les. Yeah. Well, George Benson oh, wow. came and sat in a few wow. times. Babique Reinhardt, mm -hmm. Django Sun, Burley mm. Legren. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of the Gypsy guys, the Rosenbergs, Jimmy Rosenberg, uh, uh, some like Slash, he used to come do okay. some shows He's with us. He's a good us. player. Slash yeah. is a good player. Very melodic, yeah. You know, and especially some of his songs where it was kind of in the modal thing. I mean, he was playing some nice stuff. Yeah, a lot Living of chops. Marshall, you know, oh, with his hat. Like, yeah, the hair. You know, yeah, right? beautiful. Yeah. He's, like, he's like, yeah, you sound good, man. You know, and he walks away with his two chicks. So I was like, <laughs> I want to be slammed. Yeah, no, you don't. No, you don't. You, speaking of two chicks, you have four lovely boys, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. What's incredible. that like? That's a handful. It's a handful. I mean, um, they're they're good boys, you know. God bless I mean, you. My wife's great. We, you know, get along great. We get to travel together in the summer. We do, you know, when I'm off the road, I'm home for weeks at a time. I'm going to, you know, do more and more of that as the years go on. Kind of have more of a balance since they're getting into their teenage years. Mm -hmm. I think it's good I be around, you know. So, uh yeah, it's, it's great. Very inspiring. The day I started writing educational material was a couple of days after my son, first son was born. Oh. I said, okay, I need something to give to him, like residual income. Yeah. So every day I would just write a little bit, and before you know it, I came up with you know the books that are on Mel Bay. Mm -hmm. The Rhythm Changes, The Jam and the Blues, the mm -hmm. Arpeggio book, and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, and then I just continued in that process of daily writing, mainly for them. Yeah. Because I want to be able to leave them with something on. and right. I don't have the kind of job where you have your usual kind of ways of saving. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. But you have a blessed life. You you seem like you have okay. everything anybody well, could want. It has a lot of challenges, Bob, too. You know? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I'm it's sure. not all peachy keen. Yeah. You know, yeah. like anybody's life, there are great challenges with traveling. Mm -hmm. There are great challenges with keeping your chops up. With keeping healthy on the road, mm -hmm. with keeping the music fresh, with keeping the relationship mm -hmm. with all these people in your lives, mm -hmm. you know, while traveling, it's uh, it's it's very challenging. Where do you see yourself going now? Um, well, back home this afternoon, and then. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, I just keep 
looking at the offers that are coming in and the opportunity I keep trying to get better as a guitar player mm -hmm. I keep trying to improve as a parent I keep trying to improve as a person mm -hmm. I keep trying to just keep it very positive and forward-looking okay. so it's hard to say I mean if I had my wish list uh, symphonic shows would be great play with some pops orchestras um, I love the sound of symphony orchestra. Was very inspired by Vivaldi and Beethoven and mm. Mozart. I listen to that music every day, and um, so that would be great uh, to continue playing with all these great younger guitar players as well as the old legends. But there's so many great young guys out there like Julian Lodge and mm. Oli Soikoli, Andreas Oberg, Vinny. Uh, I mean, we play together all the time, so I kind of leave him at the bottom of the list, but he's on the top of the yeah. list, to be honest he's, with you. He's, he's, he's the best he's rhythm man. guitar player that I've ever had the opportunity to play with. Mm -hmm. And he can pick things up so quickly in the double lines in his facility. But um, then there's some, you know, teenage kids now. Gian Knutson out of Annapolis. Mm. Try that name. Gian yeah, Knutson. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and a kid, a violinist out of uh, Columbus, Grant Flick, who's just, I mean, I don't understand how people at these teenage years could sound that great. Yeah. Well, I'm sure people said that about you, too, at the same, right. same time. Yeah. So that's what I look forward to, because we do have some shows planned uh, based on the younger generation, okay. you know, which I, I really uh, love doing. So I think that's what the future, and continue writing educational stuff. Mm -hmm. I just wrote two books in the last two months. Oh, great. One okay. on picking and one on... Uh, 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 a rhythm guitar fake book. Okay, for uh, Melbe. For, for True Fire. For True Fire. Yeah. Okay, for True Fire. Okay. And every time I see you in magazines or whatever, sometimes your head is shaved, oh. other times it's long. <laughs> now it's like well, medium. People, you know, you it's, send them the so current funny. pictures, and some people take pictures from like 10 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago that they have on file. I keep that for my website. <laughs> I, you know, you never age. Hey, you know? Well, it's right, exactly. There you go. Yeah. But uh, yeah, for a while there, I was uh, shaving the head, you know, getting the crew cut, and right, real right. heavy into working out and training. Yeah. You know, with a well, trainer on the road, you, you know, fit. which was uh, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So you know, you kind of go with the go yeah. with the flow. How about eating on the road? And Eating on the dying. road is tough, but not for us because we will go to Whole Foods mm -hmm. and stock up. And then every night we'll try to get a nice warm either Thai meal or something relatively healthy. Mm -hmm. If we don't, uh, are unable to get that, we always have food with us, you know, where we can make ourselves a salad or right. something like that. If you're in China or somewhere. Like well, that. even in the U.S., you know. I mean, that's where we do it. If we do a lot of ground touring, we'll, you know, we'll have more bags of Whole Foods stuff in the back seat than, than guitars, you know? Because you have to eat. I mean, you, you can't eat a guitar, eat. right? And, you know, when you're on a schedule, I, we don't want to stop for an hour mm -hmm. to eat at Denny's. No. We'd rather have an apple no. and some almonds and get to where we're going and then right. be able to. And feel better about And yourself. feel better. Well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah.